This week on States of America. Without being too melodramatic, there was an hour long or so period where this could have gotten really, really bad. A lot can be done in 13 days. And with the powers he has as the president of the United States, there's a lot that he can do. And they are worried about what he might do. Beyond sort of how the Tea Party used to be, this is a harder version of that, that sees themselves playing politics as a blood sport. And Joe Biden sort of shocked Georgia and perhaps shocked the country by winning Georgia. Uh, that was a repudiation against Donald Trump. And I think that carried over into this uh, Senate runoff. On Wednesday, the nation witnessed a pro-Trump mob infiltrate the Capitol, breaking windows and battling police. The Senate was evacuated, Capitol Hill was put on lockdown, and there were at least four fatalities. Amid the shock and confusion, we want to address how we got here. Joining me today with answers is Anna Oshbrenner, USA Today's election editor. So Anna, you were uh, covering things throughout the day and helping manage our uh, excellent stories. What um, what exactly led this to transpire? I mean, what was going on throughout the day that would lead all of these people to converge on the Capitol? So there was a rally earlier in the day uh, outside the White House. Uh, the president came out and spoke. Uh, folks were in D.C. to protest the Electoral College. You know, they they do not believe that President elect Joe Biden was elected um, fairly, that there was widespread voter fraud, even though those claims have been um, roundly disputed by the courts and President Trump's own election officials. Um, but that's where this started. There was a rally earlier in the day outside the White House where the president came out and spoke to supporters for about an hour. Um, and after that, uh, folks started making their way over to the Capitol where the Electoral College process was set to kick off early afternoon. Our visual journalists put together a beat by beat of what happened at the Capitol. Let's take a look. And after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. the Capitol, to smash windows, to occupy offices, the floor of the United States Senate rummaging through desks. It's not protest. It's insurrection. I know your pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us, but you have to go home now. We love you. You're very special. did not win. Violence never wins. Freedom wins. And this is still the people's house. Let's get back to work. It, it seems that there's some confusion about why there wasn't more of a police presence there, uh, especially if this wasn't an entirely spontaneous group of people. Do you, do we have any idea why there wasn't a more robust law enforcement presence there? 
You know, I think we're going to find out a lot more about that in the next few days. You've, we've already seen um, since uh, Wednesday, members of Congress, leadership in Congress calling for the resignation of, um, you know, the higher ups in the Capitol Police, the sergeant at arms in both chambers. So there are a lot of questions, both, you know, within Congress and outside of Congress, um, particularly when you look at the difference in what the response among law enforcement was in the summer when you had protesters, um, you know, protesting the death of George Floyd and social justice protesters in the White House or at the White House and in the Capitol. Um, the, the difference was very stark yesterday. We've seen social media companies, Twitter and Facebook, both lock President Trump's accounts. Do you get the impression that uh, this will limit the president's ability to talk to all of his supporters? I mean, sure. It takes away his megaphone specifically. Um, but the reality is millions of people believe what the president says and they still have social media. You know, his press secretary still has social media, the people who work for him in the White House. Um, I don't think we're in a position where all of a sudden the president of the United States doesn't have any way of getting his message uh, to the American people. Um, I'll be very curious to see how long these, you know, bans last um, and if it does extend, you know, to Twitter. We saw Snapchat had already banned the president, you know, I think at least a year ago. Um, so I'm, I'm just not sure how effective it will actually be um, when there are just so many people who share his beliefs and, and who still have access to social media. In your experience covering elections, have we ever seen a group with such fervent allegiance um, to any candidate as we've seen with Trump and uh, with this group that was at the Capitol? I mean, no, as far as my own time covering politics, um, I think I have likened at times this to the support of a sports team. Um, you know, I think folks allegiance to President Trump has, has gotten to the level of what it looks like when someone really loves like a professional sports team or their college sports team. Obviously the stakes are so much higher than that, but that singular sort of dedication to a person rather than the party, I think is very different than what we've seen in uh, prior election cycles. That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, when, when the Lions uh, continually lose, we don't really see fans uh, storming Ford Field. No. <laughs> so uh, one last thing I wanted to ask about here. I mean, we've already seen uh, state media and authoritarian countries uh, making ham of these events. I mean, the Chinese tabloids were talking about how this shows uh, the chaos in American democracy. So what message are these events at the Capitol sending to other countries? I think we saw Wednesday that there, if it wasn't fear, it was definitely concern among you know leaders outside of the United States. I think if as Americans, we saw what happened yesterday happen in another country, particularly one that exports democracy throughout the world, we would have been very concerned. Um, I do think that while democracy was obviously tested, maybe to the fullest extent it has been in modern times, it did succeed. Democracy has has stood. Um, but without a doubt, democracy was damaged in this process. Our, I think our standing in the world um, was damaged. Um, you know, when we have to walk into, you know, the UN or go to a G8 summit or something like that, I think this hangs a little bit over us now going forward. And that's Anna Oshbrenner, USA Today's elections editor. Thanks so much for being here, Anna. Thanks for having me. There was a moment where they just burst through and you start seeing people flowing, like literally a flow of people. When Wednesday began, we knew two things were happening. A, we knew in President's Park on the Ellipse at around 10 a.m., President Trump and his supporters would be holding a quote, as they called it, Save America rally. 
We also knew that a little over a mile and a half away from President's Park at the Capitol building, Vice President Pence would be overseeing the certification of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's win in the 2020 presidential election. Obviously, the events of yesterday unfolded much different than how we had initially anticipated that morning. Here to discuss with somebody on the ground, as USA Today had dozens of staffers on the Capitol covering uh, the events that happened, uh, Will Carlos, who is a national correspondent for extremism, joining us now. Will, thanks for the time. We kind of set up there how the day began. How did your work day begin on Wednesday? My job was basically to be on the lookout for groups like the Proud Boys, uh, groups like uh, the Oath Keepers, um, the Three Percent Militia groups, anybody who looked like they might might be part of the groups that I monitor and cover. Um, it turns out that I was with, you know, a very talented um, guy who's based in DC and knows the city really well. It's not a city that I know very well. And so I kind of let him uh, take the lead as far as covering these protests. He's covered a lot of them. What Jack's, um, Jack's initial feeling was let's, let's stay at the ellipse until Trump did his speech. And then right after that, he said, what they're going to do is they're going to march down the, mon down the mall towards, uh, towards the Capitol building. And so right, I think about halfway through Trump's speech, we began to walk ourselves down the mall towards the Capitol building. At that point, there were already thousands of people like streaming out towards there. A lot of people hadn't been able to get into the ellipse, to the ellipse because there was limited space. So there were a huge amount of people right the way up the hill towards the Washington Monument. And it was really cold and the speech was kind of dragging on. So a lot of people started to just move off down towards the Capitol building. And there were already like I'd say a couple of thousand people, a few thousand people on the, um, on the west side of the Capitol building, kind of the back of the Capitol building. So, Will, you arrive on the Capitol, you mentioned the thousands of people that were there. What else did you notice upon arriving there? I mean, the first thing that was really apparent for me was that I, I got there and there was obviously there's been attempts to set up like a pretty flimsy, like outer perimeter. And I, I think the way to pick to this is if you're looking, you're looking at the back of a huge building and in the middle of it, there was this temporary setup which is kind of this auditorium i guess where they hold the inauguration it's like a temporary stage made out of scaffolding and then um i guess about probably 60 to 100 feet from there they had set up some just those like metal barriers like waist high chest high metal barriers what i had expected to see was rings of riot police all the way around the building two or three deep. I mean, I think that's what they, that's what I've seen, uh, at least on TV and other protests. Jack had told me to expect that. He said, look, there's going to be really heavy security. And that was the weirdest thing. And I, I think I misspoke. I think I said riot police. They weren't riot police. They were just regular DC cops, bike cops, I think. Um, they weren't in riot gear. They didn't have shields. And they were just kind of standing there, looking down at the audience and sort of saying, like, keep back. And the audience audience the the protesters at this point were already really het up really excited shouting screaming abuse at the police uh it was already getting ugly like right from the start it, it continues the, the noise builds the action builds around the building was there a particular moment that you remember when the breach happened or was it kind of like a gradual thing that led up to it kind of bring me into the the moments before the the actual breach that we all witnessed happen live. So if you go back to that scaffolding and that stage that I talked about, that was kind of impenetrable. You couldn't really get in there, but there was a gap to the side of it, to the left-hand side as you're looking at it, that was like a sort of a stone platform that at the beginning, there were probably like 10 people, maybe a dozen people who were up on that and they were facing the rest of the crowd and saying, get up here, come on up here, come on up here. And put this in the context, one of the things that, that was really driving this was that the whole time you have thousands of protesters coming down the mall. So it's almost like this building up of pressure, this building up of steam that, that was kind of constantly flowing in. And that was, I don't want to get too like, you know, metaphysical about it, but that was kind of really charging the atmosphere. There was really this feeling of like these people, you know, this, this is really moving towards something. So these 10 guys are up there and... Facing off against them are three or four 
police officers who are basically just kind of standing there like this going, no, stay back, stay back. And I'm watching it. And as I'm watching it, the, the group of people who are up on, on the side starts getting bigger. So it goes from 10 people to maybe 20 people. And this is over the course of like half an hour. And I'm thinking, like, why aren't they putting more people here? Like when you watch riot protest, when you watch riot police in action, when you watch protests, when there's a clear entry point where people have moved in front of the crowd, the natural response is for the riot police to come in, get their shields together and push them back and push them off or, or to tear gas them or to use flash bangs and other things that was happening there was tear gas being deployed and there were flashbangs going off in the sort of the main crowd area but in this, this sort of side incursion maybe because the police were too busy dealing with the other crowd there was really just these three guys and as that crowd started to get bigger and bigger and bigger i watched log i'd say about that much in diameter sort of four to six inches in diameter this kind of log and i was like they're going to use that as the battering ram and sure enough that's what they did and they started pushing that they were also tearing apart the canvas on the side of the the inauguration stage and starting to climb into the scaffolding to the right and as 40 minutes went by 45 minutes went by and there was still no backup i was like they're gonna get through and sure enough I'm, I'm unclear as to exactly what happened, whether they ordered the police to stand back, which is what some people have said, or whether they simply pushed through. But there was a moment where they just burst through and you start seeing people flowing, like literally a flow of people up onto the, the kind of rampart surrounding the back of the Capitol. And it went from 10 people to 20 people to 200 people to 2000 people like really i'd say within kind of 20 minutes and that's when you see all the footage of the people kind of streaming in and the people climbing up the wall the ironic thing is they didn't really have to be climbing that wall they could have just gone up with everybody else it was like 20 40 feet away they could have gone up and gone up with the other people but i you know people do silly things in crazy situations and i think people were showing off and trying to you know show how brave they were so people started to climb up the, uh, the sides of the wall as well I think what happened um, is that at the same time that the people burst through, the order was given to just say, okay, we're just gonna relinquish and let people in the front of the building, to, like not the front of the building, but the front of the grounds too. My thinking is they quickly realized, look, it's surrounded. We're not gonna be able to hold this crowd off. What we need to do is step back and secure the uh, and secure the the, the building. Um, but I don't know. There's a lot of questions I have about the way that it was handled. What was your main takeaway way from it? Was it one particular scene that you witnessed at the Capitol building? Was it a, a general thought? I called my wife and I said, go and buy food. And that sounds crazy, but I have a family. And I said, look, I think we're facing a real constitutional crisis and this could be an actual coup. And but that sounds dramatic, but like I literally thought that the next thing I was going to see was going to be Congress people, members of Congress, members of the Senate brought out, you know, with nooses around their neck or whatever to be beaten up by the crowd. And maybe that's because most of the riots that I've covered, most of the protests like this that I've covered have been in other countries and uh, where, where things like that have happened. But that I think we were pretty close to that happening yesterday. I'd say without being too melodramatic, there was an hour long or so period where this could have gotten really, really bad. And this country could have faced a really, really serious uh, constitutional and democratic crisis. And I think we narrowly avoided it. It's easy to look back now with 2020 vision and say, hey, this was reasonably quickly and peacefully uh, dealt with and the Congress was able to reconvene and the Senate was able to reconvene. They were able to hold the vote and, you know, aren't we all good and calm and everything's fine. But like, yeah, it's very lucky. I think, I think we really narrowly avoided a serious, serious crisis. Will Carles, USA Today national correspondent on extremism. Will, uh, glad you're safe. Appreciate your work and thanks for your time. Thank you. Beyond sort of how the Tea Party used to be, sort of Republican Party. This is a harder version of that, that 
sees themselves playing politics as a blood sport. As Trump supporters breached the Capitol on Wednesday, they carried a number of flags with them. Confederate flags, ones touting Trump is my president, and the familiar don't tread on me flag, a very popular symbol among far right groups, including the Patriot Movement. My guest says there's no denying that this conservative faction was among the forces behind the chaos on Capitol Hill this week. Rich, my friend, how are you? Doing well. Glad to see you made it through this week and uh, from being on the scene there in D.C. Thank you. It was a scene, let me tell you. Um, so we were out there, myself and uh, my colleague Ryan Miller, reporting on these events. We started the morning at the Trump rally and we ended up, as many did, on the Capitol grounds. And I just wanted to ask you, one of the things I heard that really stood out to me from Trump supporters from all parts of the day and walks of life was referring to one another using the word patriot. You know, this person is a patriot, that person is a patriot. I'm curious, is this really a movement or is it really just a way of talking about how people view one another when they share this ideology of, you know, conservatism and being pro-Trump? Yeah, the term patriot has sort of been co-opted by this right wing of the Republican Party. And, and here in Arizona, for the last year, uh, my colleague Rob Adele and I have spent a lot of time looking into this movement, and I've spent some time talking to some of its adherents. And it really is beyond sort of how the Tea Party used to be, sort of the Republican Party. This is a harder version of that, that sees themselves playing politics as a blood sport. You know, they're not looking at, at minor issues, tax policies or things like that, the deficit. They feel that the country is in a life and death struggle and particularly believe that President Trump was going to be the one to lead them out of this. Uh, there's a lot of conspiratorial thinking. And because much of the activity takes place on social media, uh, it becomes this echo chamber where conspiracies live and fester and get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. I want to ask you about some of that conspiratorial thinking because uh, numerous people that we spoke to yesterday and today, you know, in DC, on their way out of DC, all of that stuff, have shared the idea that the people who actually breached the police barricades and entered the Capitol building yesterday were not really a part of the Trump supporters. They weren't real patriots, including uh, a face familiar from your reporting. What can you tell me about the uh, Viking deferred man? And is he actually, you know, was he an Antifa shill who is posing to make them look bad as an anti-fascist trying to make the real patriots look bad? Or is he indeed a legitimate member of this patriot movement that you've done so much reporting on? The man we're talking about is named Jake Angeli, and I first encountered him uh, February, uh, back before the, the pandemic really hit here in Arizona at a Donald Trump rally uh, in Phoenix. And he was walking around in a similar outfit to what I think everyone saw him uh, in the Senate yesterday uh, at the speaker's podium, uh, the president's podium. Uh, and he talked about QAnon, the QAnon conspiracy theory that imagines that Donald Trump is leading an investigation into uh, all sorts of nefarious doings by top leaders uh, and that arrests are imminent. Um, he has been a fixture at Trump events. He stationed himself outside the Maricopa County uh, Elections Department as they were counting the ballots, protesting the results. Uh, he's also been at, at just sort of Black Lives Matter rallies over the summer. Um, anything where he can get the QAnon gospel out. Uh, I He was not happy with the way he was portrayed in our story, so he's not talking to me anymore. He gave some props to the Arizona Republican AZ Central for correctly pointing out in our story that ran this week that he is a QAnon supporter and not Antifa. I do find it uh, amusing, I guess, that someone who is so steeped in conspiracy theory has now become the subject of a conspiracy himself. My question to you is, now that we've seen some of this rhetoric, QAnon, the Patriot Movement, et cetera, leap off the pages of the internet and into real life, what's next? I mean, are they gonna go away? Are they gonna be pushed off of the mainstream social media sites the way Trump, for example, was in the immediate aftermath of this insurrection? Uh, will they disappear? Who do they talk to now? I'll dodge that by saying it's hard to say. Uh, the, the leader of their movement, Donald Trump, 
uh, is expected to be leaving office shortly. And I don't know how the Patriot movement and the QAnon movement will see Trump leaving the stage uh, if nothing dramatic happens as they might predict will, will be the case. They are systematically being released. Here in Arizona, the Patriot groups that used Facebook to communicate, they are systematically being removed from these sites and moving to places like MeWe or Parler. But there is not as much action there. Not as many people are, are getting there. And maybe that's just a human thing, like, oh, I have to download one more app to be in this group. Uh, they're getting less of an audience uh, among themselves. Uh, so I'm not sure what the future will hold uh, come February. So what among the symbols that we saw outside of the Capitol tells us definitively that the Patriot movement was there? Well, it is, you do look at the symbols, the signs, the rhetoric online. I mean, there are Trump supporters and then there are Trump supporters, the people who will spend their day at a rally or fly across the country to go to Washington, DC. That portends someone particularly motivated for their candidate. And among the Patriot movement, the only person who inspires that kind of loyalty is Donald Trump. Uh, and we, I do know there were, I do know there were at least a handful of people from Arizona there. They talked on social media about going to Washington, D.C. to be there. And this feeling that has been circulating online, a lot of it, of course, is bravado on chatter. It's much braver uh, when you're behind a keyboard than in real life. But a lot of talk of this is the day. This is the day where something dramatic is going to happen. Wait till this day. You know, a lot of 1776 type discussions, all that sort of gives this impression that the Patriots were the ones who were there at the Capitol yeah, uh, this week. All of that suggests that the Patriots were the ones who, who stormed the U.S. Capitol this week. Well, Rich Rellis, my friend and colleague, thank you so much for your good reporting on this and, uh, and everything else that you do. Thank you for having me. A lot can be done in 13 days. And with the powers he has as the president of the United States, there's a lot that he can do. And they are worried about what he might do. I just think about had this group of, had that group of people been black or brown, um, especially black, it would not have happened this way. There would, we, we wouldn't have made it to the steps to be able to then come in the doors. That was Black Lives Matter activist turned Congresswoman Cori Bush, a Democrat from Missouri, speaking about Wednesday's riot on Capitol Hill. A number of elected officials and civil rights leaders have spoken out about this, and they've called out the difference between law enforcement's presence on Wednesday and law enforcement's presence during the Black Lives Matter protests. One of those elected officials to do so, President-elect Joe Biden. No one can tell me that if it had been a group of Black Lives Matter protesting yesterday, there wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been treated very, very differently. And it is unacceptable. And joining me now to discuss USA Today national correspondent, Deborah Barfield Berry. Deborah, thank you so much for the time. Uh, you know, let's talk about the president elect's words here because on Wednesday, when he addressed the nation, he reiterated this idea that, you know, words from the president matter. So how will the president-elect's words from Thursday impact this conversation that we're having now about law enforcement? So the lawmakers and the civil rights group leaders who I've talked to, they're looking to President-elect Biden to bring a little sense of calm to the country and to bring a sense of fairness. So when he comes out and when he has come out and, and made comments like he did yesterday about the disparity or the, the differences in approach, the police approach, that, he, they say, matters because it shows that he's paying attention to that problem, that he acknowledges that problem, and then with that, in some way, can he can help to address it. So what he says, how he says, makes a huge difference. You know, I'm curious, as, as far as some of the civil rights leaders that you've spoken with, because, I mean, let's face it, there's still a lot of racial injustice in this country. And it would be very naive for all of us to believe that, you know, protests around that racial injustice are over. I'm sure it's, it's far from it. 
Are they expressing yet any concerns over what those protests may look like going forward now that there is this kind of renewed call to arms for law enforcement? They're worried that even going forward, some people may be even more emboldened to do more of that, not just at the Capitol, but in other places. So is there concern? Is there worry about what going forward? Absolutely. Absolutely. What steps can, can these civil rights leaders take to, you know, to kind of whether it's to counter that, you know, protect others from that? I mean, I mean, what, what are they, I guess, trying to do ar around this now? Well, you know, Ralphie, one of the most immediate things they've been calling for, and that was like minutes after all of this happened, Derek Johnson of the NAACP, the Urban League, um, the National Action Network, all those groups out the box came out and, and, and called for the president to be removed, President Trump to be removed from office. They are pointing to him as the person who kind of incited it. They are pointing to some of the other Republicans who have supported him and egging that on. So for them, they think that's one. That's the most immediate step to take. Then they're looking for the new administration to also step up. Um, they're calling for a special advisor who would play a role of working on racial in inequality and issues like that. They're calling for that. And they're calling for working on ways that we can kind of try to heal the country. But they acknowledge that there's a long way to go. That the the last for the, from their perspective, the last few years have kind of set the country back. And race relations back a long we, We've seen a, a lot of elected officials now, or I shouldn't say a lot, but we've seen a number of very prominent elected officials mm -hmm. call for President Trump's removal via the 25th Amendment. Yes. Given that he has less than two weeks left in his term, is that viable? Depends on who you talk to. Um, some are arguing with only a few weeks left, is that even like you said, viable, worth the trouble, worth trying to do, worth the fight. Some are arguing, how could you not? <laughs> They're arguing that 13 days, a lot can be done in 13 days. And I was just talking to uh, Representative Horsford out of Nevada, um, who's he's a, he's vice chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, and he says he needs to go now. And that, particularly in his position and with the powers he has as the President of the United States, there's a lot that he can do, and they are worried about what he might do. USA Today national correspondent Deborah Barfield Berry. Deborah, uh, thanks so much for your work and your time. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Joe Biden sort of shocked Georgia and perhaps shocked the country by winning Georgia. Uh, that was a repudiation against Donald Trump, and I think that carried over into this uh, Senate runoff. In this election, Democrats won the presidency as well as the House of Representatives. But up till this week, the Senate was still up for grabs. Would Republicans maintain their hold on power? Or could Democrats flip the two seats in Georgia's special election to win back control of the Senate? Here with the answers is Raina Cash. She's editor of the Savannah Morning News, part of the USA Today Network. Raina, welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to be with you, Susan. Well, in fact, Democrats did manage to flip both those Georgia Senate seats. How did they do that? Uh, yeah, this was a, a major, major win. So we had uh, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who was running against uh, the incumbent Kelly Leffler. And then in the other race, we had uh, John Ossoff, who was facing incumbent David Perdue. And um, as just as we saw in the presidential election, uh, when Joe Biden sort of shocked Georgia and perhaps shocked the country by winning Georgia, uh, that was a repudiation against Donald Trump. And I think that carried over into this uh, Senate runoff. Uh, traditionally, Democrats do not turn out as well for runoffs. But in this case, there were three million uh, early votes uh, here in this race. And uh, nearly as many people voted this time around as they did in the general election. Uh, some of that was motivated in part, if not a lot of it, motivated uh, by Donald Trump and uh, his continued um, talk about fraud in the election, I think, uh, further engaged Democrats and perhaps to some degree suppressed the Republican vote as well. Yeah, Republicans definitely unhappy when the president was denouncing the Republican governor of Georgia and the secretary of state. They're also a Republican because of his disputes with them, his unfounded uh, arguments that the election was stolen from him 
in November in the presidential race. That complicated Republican turnout. But in terms of boosting Democratic turnout, tell us how much difference you think Stacey Abrams ended up making. Oh, I think there is, uh, without question, that was one of the major factors uh, throughout this entire election period. Uh, she did not take her foot off the gas after the presidential race. Uh, if anything, uh, leaned into it even more here in the last uh, few weeks leading up to this, uh, this runoff. She has been the most influential person, I, I think you can say, here in the state in terms of motivating the Democrats, getting people registered to vote, and not just registered, but getting people to the polls. She hit many, many states. I saw her in barbershops. I saw her in parking lots. Uh, she canvassed this state along with her Fair Fight group. Uh, from corner to corner and did not cede any ground uh, to the Republicans and that narrative that Democrats just wouldn't show up. Well, Stacey Abrams ran for governor in 2018. She lost to Brian Kemp. Do you think that Stacey Abrams is going to run for governor again in two years? I think she, a lot of people think that's the path, uh, considering that uh, at this point she was not uh, selected as a cabinet member uh, by Joe Biden. I think that uh, it's highly likely that she would again run for governor and uh, her, her chances are good. I mean, we already have now uh, President Trump has uh, basically encouraged the vote against uh, Brian Kemp. He took credit for Kemp's victory in the first place over Stacey Abrams. Uh, but now uh, there was a lot of question about whether this is a blue state in Georgia. And uh, after the presidential election, I said that it was purple. Uh, but now with two uh, Democratic senators, I think you can say it's a blue state. And um, it, it would be reasonable to assume that Stacey Abrams would ride that wave, a wave that she created herself um, into a race for governor here in the state. You know, that's a pretty quick transformation from what we thought of as a reliably red state to a purple state or even a blue state. You know, these these two new senators are each groundbreakers in their own way. The first black senator from Georgia, the first Jewish senator from Georgia. Does this reflect something fundamental that's happening in the state of Georgia? I think in Georgia and in, in the country, uh, what we're seeing is you, you hear a lot about the uh, suburban women. Well, that's not just white women anymore. Uh, there are a lot of people of color who have moved out into the suburbs they're raising their families, uh, they're, they are contributing to the economy, and they see themselves as part of the fabric of, of this state and the nation. And um, I think Stacey Abrams recognized that. I think these uh, Senate candidates, Ossoff and Warnock, recognized that. Um, this wasn't a, a race that was strictly along lines of race. You had many white liberals who as well came out and voted in favor of these Democratic candidates. Uh, the, the identity of the country is changing. Um, what we look like, how we speak, what we think about, all of that is changing. And it's uncomfortable for a lot of people and contributed in large part to what we saw uh, last night at the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. Uh, just one last question. We know that the results in the presidential race in Georgia were disputed for weeks and weeks by President Trump and his supporters. What about in these Senate races? This, these two victories have given Democrats control of the U.S. Senate, a 50-50 control in the Senate with, with the new uh, Vice President Kamala Harris around to vote uh, in case of a tie. But are these elections really over or do you think they're gonna be disputed? In Georgia, th there's an automatic recount if the margin is within 0.5%. That's not the case in, in either of these races. Uh, Warnock won by 73,000 votes and Ossoff won by about 35,000 votes. Uh, what we have here, the counties must certify the races by January 15th and the state must certify by January 22nd. And uh, considering the climate of the country, the tenor of things that, uh, that we're seeing right now, I would expect to see those dates um, moved, um, certified, moved up pretty quickly. Yeah, we're all becoming experts on election law. Raina Cash, yeah. thanks so much for bringing us up to date on what's happening in Georgia. Thank you. 
This has been States of America, honest conversations on the issues that matter most.